Um, today we're debating a very important issue um, that affects artists and arts organisations across this country. We can probably all agree on some of the principles that we seek to uphold. What's actually much more difficult is to recognise that there are no easy paths, there are no guarantees uh, by which and through which we can preserve this hard-fought-for right to freedom of free expression. Um, each case is singular, in my experience. Um, each has its own particular issues um, and its own challenges. And my purpose today is really to share with you some of the experiences of Tate as an institution which has come to see itself not simply as a museum preserving the past, but as an agent of cultural expression with a stake in the contemporary culture. And I want to use these to throw light on the challenges that face all cultural organizations in defending the rights of artists to free expression of their views. And I begin, of course, with a slide of Ai Weiwei, who in a certain sense needs no introduction, but who over the past two years has stood as, in a way, a symbol for the rights of artists and a very brave example of that of an individual standing up, not just to um, the media, but to a government and to a whole system, and nevertheless holding his position and maintaining it in spite of that pressure. Of course, um, this is Hogarth's um, Oh, the Roast Beef of Old England. It's in the Tate's collection. Um, it's a fairly, you might say, jingoistic painting. It's a painting in which uh, Hogarth fully expresses his contempt for the French. Um, you could say it's also an enduring image, um, and it certainly has a contemporary relevance. I'm not saying that Hogarth would have been a member of UKIP, but uh, he would certainly have recognized uh, some of the sentiments that come from UKIP in relation to um, the continent. However, if you look into the detail of this painting, you see Hogarth himself and the event takes place in Calais. The gate he was standing in front of was Calais Gate. And he is about to be apprehended by the long arm of the law for drawing what were thought to be fortifications in Calais. So he was arrested for spying. Um, he was put in prison for a short time. Eventually he got out, um, but he was in himself a champion for artists' rights. He was a prime mover behind the creation of the Foundling Hospital. He was very much involved in the creation of the Royal Academy and the right of artists to determine how they showed their work. Um, but here we see him uh, caught, as I say, by the long arm of the law in Calais, um, recognizing that um, he had a job to do that was to speak out and to uh, express his own views. And if we can have the next slide, his image, of course, is one which uh, has been used by cartoonists uh, ever since. Here, notably Steve Bell, who, who used the work as a direct, in a direct quotation from the Hogarth um, during the BSE crisis in 1996. But I find it interesting that the proprietor of the Sunday Times should be speaking rather than the editor in relation to uh, the publication of Gerald Scarfe's cartoon on Sunday. It's interesting, and that raises an issue which I think we will touch on, which is the relationship between editors, boards, in the case of arts organizations in the public sector, and artists. Things that shock, appall, disgust, and offend change with the mores of the time. The sculptures placed in the Strand by Epstein in 1908 would probably not cause offence today, but they caused such offence in 1908 that they were violated, as you see, and they stand in a way as a reminder of the challenges that any artist faces in pushing against the boundaries but in doing so, artists help us to question values and 
their work and the work of the organizations that pre present and indeed support their work um, is a fundamental part of how we negotiate society and establish uh, ourselves in, in a community. Epstein's problems in the Strand um, continued. And this is Rima, another work by Epstein, which still sits in a quiet corner of Hyde Park. Most of you probably in this room are unaware of its existence. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of public sculpture in London. It seems tranquil, even forgotten today. But when it was unveiled in 1925, it was greeted with outrage, not just because of the figurative description of the nude female form, but also on stylistic grounds. It was said that there was, that there was a, quote, a danger that if such things are encouraged or allowed to remain in our midst, the world will be made more hideous. This is a comment not coming not from a newspaper critic, uh, but rather from the um, president of the Royal Academy at the time, Frank Dixie. So you never know where your friends and enemies are. Often they're behind you as well as in front of you. Um, the furore around Rima nearly a century ago is a reminder that art represents a conversation between those who make and those who view it. And the two often hold very different values. Art that questions accepted values has a place in the very heart of society, and it provides a vital space in which those values can be encountered and discussed. Both the examples I've mentioned so far, Hogarth and Epstein, are, of course, the work of artists. And they weren't operating in a world of mass communication at the click of a button. But what should the role of institutions like the Tate and other cultural organizations, such as galleries and theaters across the country, be in protecting the rights of artists and in negotiating that relationship between the artists and those who experience their works? Tate is governed now by the 1992 Museums and Galleries Act, which sets its mission as being to care for and present the works of art in its collection and to promote the public's understanding and enjoyment of British, modern, and contemporary art. It acts as a champion for the voices of artists, past and present, and creates a frame for the future by showing and also acquiring work for the national collection. In so doing, institutions like Tate or the National Theatre have to balance their responsibilities to, on the one hand, artists. Secondly, the public interest in its broadest sense, if we believe that these institutions should exist to allow for debate and discussion that goes beyond what are particular sectional interests. We have to take account, nevertheless, of those different viewpoints in society. And as Jude has reminded us, we have to think about the staff who work within the institutions. We cannot necessarily take it for granted that the view that they will hold will be that of the director or even the board of trustees. So we face a complicated set of challenges. And this shows uh, Otobang Nkanga um, leading a discussion at Tate about the politics of representation. This is an event that took place in the Tate tanks in November. I think there are two conditions that lie at the center of the debate about freedom of expression. The first is trust. Trust in institutions to make judgments about freedom of expression, to do so with conviction and with an evident sense of responsibility, weighing the consequences carefully. And the second is confidence, confidence within the institution that they've made, a, made and planned a decision as best they can, where necessary with expert advice, where relevant also with the support of the Board of Trustees, and that they've made that decision with, in good faith. Museums, galleries, theatres are trusted with public money to make decisions about what art to show and how to show it. The trust is hard-earned and is engendered slowly and over time, and it can be easily dissipated. Confidence 
and conviction is based on an examination of all the issues, professional expertise, and an ability to anticipate public reaction. As with many issues based on trust, we only begin to think about freedom of, inf of expression when things go wrong. It is therefore important that the institution is able to show how it came to a decision and that it did so in good faith and in the public interest. If it does the job well, the public institution can create a platform for the open debate of issues and a meeting of different points of view. As I've said, I regard museums and galleries, theatres, and other places of congregation in the cultural sphere as platforms for the examination and expression of values. In the context of mass communication, international engagement, and the multiple cultures that make up society, this, is an increasing, this role is increasingly important, but also increasingly complicated. Cultural organizations are places in which conversations can be held between people who represent or hold values. And it is vital that freedom of expression is maintained, not just for the voice of artists past and present, but also for the discussion of their work. This will be the subject of an exhibition at Tate Britain this year, later this year, Art Under Attack. It will examine the history of iconoclasm and show some of the art that has tested boundaries and provoked debate. In the sphere of art, at least, this perhaps is one of the most famous works in the Tate, Carl Andre's Equivalent 8. In 1976, it provoked a storm about the right of an artist to use common materials to make a work of art. Indeed, is it a work of art? Much of what we'll be talking about today is about how we support the right of artists to express their views and not have it usurped by special interests. It should not be undermined, that right should not be undermined by a misunderstanding or a misapplication of the law, as Jude uh, reminded us earlier, or by putting those responsible for the law in a situation in which they are under duress or pressure or simply have no choice. Today, we need to answer the question of how we can best proceed and, or anticipate problems. Um, this responsibility to the different points of view in society and the need to maintain the freedom of expression is part of the service offered by museums, galleries, theatres, cultural organisations across the country. Tate, as with all national museums and galleries, is held accountable for delivering public service by its board of trustees. They are responsible for ensuring that public money is spent wisely and well and for establishing the broad outlines of policy while well, responsibility for artistic leadership lies with the director and the professional staff. We therefore have a range of skills and interests represented on the board. At Tate, I regard ourselves as being extremely fortunate that the Act of Parliament, the Museums and Galleries Act of 1992, that governs Tate, provides that we have three artists on the board of trustees. At the moment, there are Thomas Apts, Wolfgang Tillmans, and Bob and Roberta Smith, um, whose work is shown here and who will be speaking later today, I believe. Trustees often have the difficult task of distinguishing, di distinguishing between a personal point of view and their own personal moral position and an institutional point of view. And I'm sure that's an issue that we will come back to Jude raised it. I'm certain we'll want to discuss it later today. It's important that they act not in that sense, not just in distinguishing between personal and institutional, not just in issues to do with freedom of speech, but also in all areas of policy, including the direction of the program, but most importantly also in associations that the institute make, institution might make, for instance, in the field of sponsorship. At Tate, we're lucky because we can call on highly experienced, a highly experienced board of trustees, and we can consult experts and lawyers. But being a major and high profile public organization also means that there is increased awareness and scrutiny of all the decisions that we make 
and there is widespread public comment. Next slide. Comment from our visitors. We need to ensure that different points of view are reflected on the board. We need to take, be aware of the pressures and the different points of view that exist in society. But we need also to create a space in which we can test decisions. What does the law say? Have the views of X, Y, or Z been sought? Who else might have an opinion on the matter of hand? And within the board, we have an ethics committee comprising trustees and some outside individ individuals not directly connected with the organization, but who can reflect a different and external point of view. And that ethics committee, in many instances, been, has been incredibly valuable to Tate. The last thing I want to do is to give the impression that Tate has all the answers. We don't. We're very conscious of the consequences and difficulties because we haven't always got it right. The business of defending freedom of expression can often feel not unlike Turner strapping himself to the mast and experiencing a snowstorm um, off the east coast of England. You are isolated, you have colleagues, you have trustees, but as a director, you often have to take very difficult decisions with a clamor around you. I want to describe four examples of decisions we've taken, how we consulted, tried to take different considerations and points of view into account, and what happened. In each of the issues I discuss, we could not have foreseen all the eventualities, but the awareness gained from the experience adds to our foresight in the future. The four are, first, the decision to speak out in the interests of Ai Weiwei, which relates to the general principle of freedom of expression for the artist. Secondly, the exhibition of Mark Wallinger's State Britain, a work which examined issues and was implicitly critical of government. The decision to remove a work by Richard Prince which raises it from an exhibition, Pop Life, which raises issues about the law relating to child protection. And then finally, the decision not to show a work by John Latham at a particular moment, which relates to issues of faith. In the case of Ai Weiwei, who at the moment of his arrest in Beijing um, was showing work in the Turbine Hall at Tate Modern, we felt the need to give visible support to an artist with whom we've had a long relationship. With our encouragement and that of others, the Foreign Secretary, William Haig, made a statement in support of the artist, which was an unusual step for a Foreign Secretary to take at such an early stage in the debate. A number of international museum colleagues organized a petition and after consultation with the artist trustees, we decided to contribute to these statements by putting the word release before the standard exhibition listing Ai Weiwei on the light box at Tate Modern. It was a decision taken by the director after consulting, as I say, with artist trustees, but not with the full board. In doing so, we felt we were championing the very principles for which we all are here to discuss today, but it was controversial and some people thought that it was not the position of an institution like the Tate to make a stand of this kind. We argued that our mission was to promote the public understanding and enjoyment of British modern and contemporary art, and in Ai Weiwei's detainment, we saw a real threat to that expression. A further problem was that China is a country in which the government is anxious to build relations. That made it even more surprising and indeed welcome that William Hague was prepared to make a statement. And in fact, China, of course, is a country with which Tate is building links. So the statement had the potential to be politically very sensitive. In this instance, the speed and nature of the issue meant that the director and senior staff took the decision without reference, as I've said, to all the trustees. But the 
trustees stood by the Tate actions. However, as Jude has also reminded us, it raises the need for trustees to be clear about their position on such matters of principle in advance of their occurrence. A framework for a policy on free expression is a very necessary part of the equipment, I think, of any cultural organisation. We should not be in a position where the organisation is having to make up its policy on the spur of the moment. A rather similar situation developed around the Tate's display in, in 2007 in Mark Wallinger State, Britain, a replica of Brian Hawes' protest camp in Parliament Square, just across the line, and ours was, our Mark's piece at Tate was placed just on the other side of the exclusion line that had been drawn um, around the Houses of Parliament. To a degree, it was controversial because it represented a public organisation hosting work critical of the then government at a moment of considerable political sensitivity. It was made more so by articles in the press portraying the exhibit as a direct criticism by Tate of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. In this instance, the issue was not so much about how the Tate had gone about showing the work, but the perception it created thereafter and that as the trustees had fully supported the exhibition and there had been much discussion within the institution about the consequence of sharing a work of this kind. The work examined freedom of expression in the UK, Mark giving support essentially to Brian Hoare. We considered, as I say, the implications of that in advance, but it seemed to us important that the museum should be prepared to act as a platform for the exchange of views and ideas in this way. Pop Life. In 2009, Tate presented the exhibition Pop Life, including a work by Richard Prince, Spiritual America. It was a photograph of a photograph of the then 10-year-old Brooke Shields naked. It was an image that had been taken with the consent of Brooke Shields and her family. The image had, was well known. It was free available online and is still available online. And it was available on publication, in publications on Richard Prince, available in bookshops across the country. Furthermore, the work had been shown in 2007 at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, where there had been no concern expressed. And members of Tate's team had visited New York and tested responses both to the work and to its inclusion in the catalogue. In advance of the exhibition, at the preview, journalists arrived to view the show, and one of them questioned whether we had the right, and indeed whether it was appropriate for us to be showing this work. We sought the advice of lawyers and the police. In the meantime, the show had opened with the work on view, but immediately coverage of the issue in the press had encouraged some members of the public to complain to the police who came to view the work during the gallery's opening hours. I have to say that Metropolitan Police behaved with real care and consideration. They have experience of these kinds of issues to a degree that some other police forces across the country might not have done, but they nevertheless came to the view that the work was contravening an act of parliament by its presentation and could be regarded as an incitement. The advice that we took from lawyers led us to decide to remove the work, partly because of its context within the exhibition and partly because of the understanding of the law. The law having been drafted and passed in Parliament in terms of the protection of young children, perhaps, well, almost certainly, without any expectation that it might then be used to prevent the exhibition of a work of this kind. A further factor for us was that the press campaign was resulting in individuals sending letters 
and messages that would threaten, that threatened the security of the work itself. Tate didn't own the work. He had a duty of care to the owner, not to be able to return it to the owner in good condition. And for those reasons, we decided to remove it. On the further advice of lawyers, we also decided Tate Enterprises, the board of Tate Enterprises, which is a sub uh, committee of the main board of Tate, but independent as, in, as an institution, decided to obscure the image in the catalogue. So we were put, placed in a position that we would not have wanted to be in by a series of events, including obviously press harassment, um, that left us not fully, I would say, defending the position of the artist. Finally, John Latham. In 1991, John Latham produced this work, God is Great. It's the artist's examination of the power of religion both to unite and divide, and it features a copy of the Bible, the Quran, and the Talmud, bisected by a pane of glass. In 2007, the work had been shown in many private galleries, and it had also been on view at Tate Britain for several months. But in July 2007, we were about to put it back on view, and the context was changed very dramatically by the July uh, bombings in London. Tate consulted senior Muslim leaders about the work who argued strongly that the mutilation of the Quran would be an incitement and would be regarded by many Muslims as deeply offensive. And it could result in protests taking place at Tate. And those protests in the context of the July 7th bombings were felt by the director of Tate Britain, myself, and the trustees that we consulted to be a reason not to add to that very, very heightened tension in those months, we, in those weeks. We later put the work on view again, but we took the view that we should not be showing it at that moment. We had a very difficult task to balance the voice of the artist who's dismayed at the prospect of his work being removed or not shown, against the sense, had to balance these against the sensitivities of the moment and the safety of our staff and the public. In all of these matters, we deal with opinions. As individuals, you may agree or disagree with the course that we took, but I've introduced them as a way of discussing how we took the decision, the conditions under which we were working, and this will apply, I'm sure, to many other institutions. So it's these issues that I think begin to focus our minds on some of the challenges that we do face as a result, I hope, of today's discussions. I mean, first of all, how can we share and build from each other's experiences in a world which is very fast moving? How can we build a set of resources and give guidance that will allow people to make decisions in these difficult areas? What or who could act as a common resource for organizations in these circumstances? I talked about isolation. At the moment, it's very difficult to know where to turn if you face a challenge on one of these issues. And then finally, how can we avoid passing laws that have unintended consequences? We need to be more vigilant as to what legislation is going through Parliament, but we also need a means to prosecute and that vigilance to ensure and to make the representations that are required to ensure that there is not an unintended consequence and that freedom of expression for artists in this country can be maintained. Thank you.